My name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, panel discussion and workshop. I want to begin by thanking the person who's done most of the work to make it possible, and that's Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator <laughs> of the Center. I feel especially guilty this time because I've spent the last two weeks in Europe uh, relaxing while she was uh, doing everything to make this possible. The focus of tonight's panel discussion, which is going to be the first phase of this two-part session, is on Canadian teachers, that is kindergarten to grade 12 teachers, on their rights to free expression. The interesting and important questions about students' rights to free expression will be for another occasion, as will discussion on American jurisprudence with respect to teachers' expressive rights in the United States. Uh, we're putting those restrictions on given the limitations of time we have. Dealing with teachers' rights to free expression in the time we have will, will more than adequately fill our time. Um, our discussion of teachers' free expression rights will both be what those rights currently are and what they should be. Both of these are matters of debate. The distinction between a teacher's expressive rights, what they are currently, and what they should be, is a really vital distinction, as rights are continually being changed and redefined. They're never written in stone, but continually being modified by a complex interplay of practice um, and custom, and by court and arbitral decisions which both shape and are shaped by custom and practice. So one of the objectives of this session tonight is to give you a better idea of views on what expressive rights teachers currently have and don't have. Perhaps a more important objective is opening up consideration of what expressive rights teachers should have in order to be able to do their jobs properly and how we can move toward obtaining those expanded expressive rights for teachers. A starting point is the fact that free expression rights of all public employees have always been hotly contested in Canada. Uh, think of the long time limits, now gone, on federal civil servants. Rights to uh, express their political views, to have a lawn sign in an election, or to work in a political campaign. Even more contentious, however, has been the free expression rights of public employees responsible for the education of children and young people. Not just teachers' rights in school, but their expressive rights outside of their workplace in their private lives. Arguably, for many teachers in the 19th century, the distinction between rights in the workplace and in private life hardly existed. Uh, you've undoubtedly seen these many lists of rules uh, for teachers uh, from 100 years ago, which had a long set of grim menial duties that teachers had to fulfill, bringing in buckets of water and a scuttle of coal each day, sweeping the floor at least once each day, scrubbing the floor at least once a week with hot soapy water, clean the blackboards at least once a day, start the fire at 7 a.m. and have the wo school warm by 8 a.m., fill the lamps and clean the chimney daily, etc. These lists also contain many limitations on teachers' activity and expression outside of the school. I'll just read you uh, four or five items on the list. Women teachers who marry or engage in improper conduct will be dismissed. They may not ride in a carriage or automobile with any man except their father or brother. They may not smoke cigarettes. They may not dress in bright colors. Men teachers who take one evening, I'm sorry, men teachers may take one evening each week for courting purposes, or two evenings a week if they go to church regularly. <laughs> After 10 hours in school, teachers may spend the remaining time reading the Bible or other good books. Every teacher should lay aside from each day's pay a goodly sum of his earnings. He should use his savings during his retirement years so that he will not become a burden on society. That was their notion of pensions, I guess. Any teacher who smokes, uses liquor in any form, visits pool halls or public halls, or gets shaved in a barber shop, will have good reason for people to suspect his worth, intentions, and honesty. Well, 
Uh, well, these rules turn out to be more of an urban legend than fact. Uh, if you Google rules for teachers, you'll see these lists purportedly from various places. There's been some serious research into them, and it's not clear any of them actually existed quite as they're written. Uh, but they're used regularly by teachers today, or teachers' federations today, to say, boy, things have really changed and improved. Um, but they're, they point to a continuity that's relevant for us tonight, namely that the limitations on te teachers' free expression rights in all aspects of their lives, while different and specific language, remain. Um, an element of the residual 19th century view that I was just reading still lives on in the current Ontario Education Act. Section 264.1 says it is the duty of a teacher and a temporary teacher in Section C, and I'm quoting, to inculcate by precept and example respect for religion and the principles of Judeo-Christian morality and the highest regard for truth, justice, loyalty, love of country, humanity, benevolence, sobriety, industry, frugality, purity, temperance, and all other virtues. Now, that's not the 19th century. That's the current Ontario Education Act. Starting in the 19th century, teachers sought protection from their difficult, poor paying, and intrusive workplace situations in two different ways. Uh, one was organizing as collective interest groups, really the forerunners of today's teachers' federations. Uh, and secondly, organizing as incipient professionals, sort of the forerunner in Ontario, at least, of the Ontario College of Teachers. These were, and still in my view are, often at odds with each other. It is useful to consider the role of collective agreements in expanding free expression rights, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about that a bit, and professional standards. Uh, in limiting the, and explore the role of professional standards in actually limiting free expression rights, especially the limitations beyond the workplace, by perpetuating broadly a 19th century view that all aspects of your life are rightly constrained by your job, a view largely discarded for most other public sector jobs, including university and college teachers. I spent the previous 16 years of my life as the executive director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, and I can assure university college teachers have dramatically broader free expression rights than any K-12 teachers in this country. Um, I'll give you an example. For, um, one of the professional advisories of the Ontario College of Teachers says, and I quote, there is a distinction between the professional and private life of a teacher. Practitioners are individuals with private lives. However, off-duty, I always worry when there's a nice opening statement followed by a however. However, off-duty contact matters. Sound judgment and due care should be exercised. Well, that's true. I mean, that's good advice for all of us. But what does this mean? Before advising that, and I quote, members should maintain a sense of professionalism in all, at all times in their personal and professional lives, the Ontario College of Teacher Advisories issues a chilling warning. Quote, teaching is a public profession. Canada's Supreme Court rules that teachers' off-duty conduct, even when not directly related to students, is relevant to their suitability to teach. It then, the Ontario College of Teachers Advisory, then cites as the basis for this broad claim three Canadian Supreme Court cases that have come to be known as the trilogy, Audette, Ross, and the Toronto Board versus OSSTF each dealing with a very narrow and specific situation that hardly warrants a broad claim. Audette is about a 22-year-old male phys ed teacher who during the summer ended up at a cottage with a 14-year-old girl who had been in his phys ed class the previous year but was not now his student, it was the summer, uh, and they had oral sex. Uh, Ross is about a Moncton Elementary School teacher who made public publicly made racist and discriminatory comments about Jews in books, in pamphlets, in letters to the local newspaper, and in television interviews. And Toronto versus OSSTF was about a teacher who had repeatedly and unsuccessfully applied for a vice principalship. Uh, when he didn't get it, filed a complaint with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, alleging it was discrimination based on his South Asian origin. Uh, and when that was denied, began writing letters to the Board of Education containing a number of very disturbing accusations 
uh, and what could be perceived as veiled threats to the lives of the director of education and others. So saying that what you do outside of school can have a bearing on your fitness to teach makes sense in extreme cases like that. But those cases are not talked about in their extreme, but used just as a general advisory. You better be cautious about what you do outside of school. So yes, courts have said behavior outside the workplace can affect your suitability in the workplace. But at the extremes, uh, in my view, or as is suggested by the Ontario College of Teachers in a more pervasive and restrictive manner. There certainly is anecdotal evidence that teachers face more extensive outside workplace restrictions than almost any other category of employee. So we will also be discussing restrictions in school. To take just one example that from a list that one of our panelists uh, provided, think about what you do in this situation. A school is a dress code, including a no hats rule. A teacher believes the rule interferes with a student's freedom of expression and refuses to enforce the rule. Another teacher complains to the administration. So let's get on to the discussion. We're starting uh, to, tonight. We'll go on till, with the discussion part until 7 o'clock with our eminent panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce them and then moderate a discussion of them before opening up to all of you. At 7 o'clock, we'll end that phase. We'll break for 15 minutes to give you time for those of you who didn't eat or want to eat more to get something to eat, to go to the washroom. And at 17, 15 sharp, we're going to move into the breakout sessions. Uh, and each of you signed up for your preferred uh, topics for those, and we'll explain those when we get to it. So now let me introduce our remarkable panel. First, and if you could come up when I introduce you, the first is Danielle McLaughlin who spent 28 years as Director of Education for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, retiring last year. Uh, she worked closely with the CCLA's legendary Executive Director, Alan Borovoy, and developed programs and resources to help teachers and students think critically about their rights and freedoms. As Danielle proudly says, she's been a civil liberties advocate since she was old enough to say, that's not fair. Uh, she's also author curiously, have a book entitled That's Not Fair, Getting to Know Your Rights and Freedoms, published by Kids Can Press as their 2016 Citizen Kid book for children in grades two to six. She is also a co-author with her son, Reuben McLaughlin, of That's Not Fair, a website, a website with videos for children aged seven to 11. Danielle is particularly concerned about the loss of freedom of expression experienced by teachers and students in Canada's education systems. Our second speaker, if you want to come up, Marvin? Yeah, sure. Um, is Marvin Zucker. Marvin is an associate professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto, where he has taught education law since 1981. And just until December of last year, he was Mr. Justice Zucker. Uh, he served as a judge of the Ontario Court of Justice, first appointed in 1978. Marvin is the author and co-author of multiple publications, including books and articles in the areas of education law, women and children's rights. He was appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Bloor View School Authority in 2013. And our third panelist, Jerry, um, is Jerry Russo, uh, Rasso. Oh, Jerry Rasso, who I've actually known for a long time in different contexts. He is the in-house counsel for the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association. He graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School in 1988 and since then has represented trade unions and their members. He regularly appears before the Ontario College of Teachers and the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario and has acted as counsel before the Ontario Labor Relations Board, other administrative tribunals, and arbitration hearings on a wide variety of labor and employment law issues. Jerry is a member of the Canadian Association of Labor Lawyers and the Ontario Bar Association. Now what we're gonna do is each of these panelists is gonna give a five minute introductory set of remarks. And following each of their five minute introductory set of remarks, I'm gonna moderate a conversation amongst them. Uh, I can assure you, not having heard what they're going to say, I can assure you they don't agree on all things. Uh, I hope they don't because we only needed one of them if, if they were gonna all agree. Uh, and so we'll have a conversation amongst them and then uh, toward the end of it, bring you and uh, the audience in to have, uh, if you have questions or comments that you would like to make, and we'll end at 7. And then at 7.15, we'll uh, move into the breakout discussion groups. 
uh, and I'll tell you more about those when we get to that point. So you're first up, Danielle. Thank you very much. Is, am, am I audible? You are. Okay, that's great. Um, Firstly, I'd like to thank all of you for being here uh, on this lovely evening, uh, coming inside to get into arguments, you know, <laughs> what can I say? I'm really delighted to have you here. Um, and I am thrilled to be able to be on the same platform as, as my fellow panelists. These are the knowledgeable folks. I'm just here to be an irritant, I think. <laughs> but. I'd like to say that um, most, my guess is most of the people in this room have heard at one time or another that uh, the answer to the question, when are you not a teacher, is never, right? That, that once, once you, you sign on to becoming a teacher, that's it for the rest of your life. You are uh, to be held in a particular high esteem by uh, society and your behavior must be constrained and your speech must be constrained. And my serious problem with this is how are we going to engage our students to develop a sense of who they are in a democratic society if we constrain our teachers and don't allow them to voice their own views and to speak about their own values. And yes, it has limits. Um, I, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, when I first started uh, to speak with people uh, in faculties of education and in schools, I saw the image of the scales of justice. And almost every law class I've been in, there's, there's an image of the scales of justice. And I thought, Th this is really kind of boring. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm really tired of this symbol. And then I started to think about it more and more. And I realized, you know, I kind of like this thing. Because if you've actually ever used a swing balance, it's really hard to use. And in fact, it never stays still. If you're weighing, you can't just weigh one thing. Like you don't see a bathroom scale on the front of a courthouse. That's not gonna happen, right? You see the, the two pan balance because we know that we're always weighing one thing against another. And over time, that's going to be changing how we see this. So what I'd really like to consider today is today. What's okay for a teacher to engage with today, and how has that changed? I think Jim's reading of some of the rules that, that teachers uh, suffered under um, you know, much earlier, I, I was just uh, saying to Marvin, I actually met the first woman in Ontario, a teacher who was permitted to wear trousers. It's not that long ago that this changed. And, and she was only given special permission because she had a, a mobility disability and she wanted to be able to cover her legs and therefore she was given permission to wear trousers. No one else, just, just her for that period of time. You know, if somebody said to teachers now, um, sorry, this is your uniform, uh, you might say, well, what's that for? But not a lot of us are saying to our students who have a dress code, what's that for? I think that um, what I've come to really appreciate is section one of the charter. And for those of you who've heard me before, you know that that's one of my favorite topics because I think it's this wonderfully Canadian thing and it really helps us understand what it is we don't understand. Because it starts out, you know, if you think about, say, for example, um, you know, bills of rights in other countries, usually they've got a list of your rights, and then they kind of throw it out there and say, you fight it out. But we're, we're Canadian, so we're very polite, so we don't do this. We say, um, excuse me, uh, before we tell you what your rights are, they are going to be limited but don't worry, because it's going to be reasonable. Is this Canadian? Right? This is so Canadian. So we all understand that each and every one of our rights and freedoms will be subject to reasonable limitations as demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, justified by law. Well, what does that mean when it's at home? You know, so if we know that in our lifetime, you know, we can meet people who thought that it was reasonable for teachers to have to wear skirts and dresses, what changed? And when did it change? And who said that it should change? If, if people say to you as teachers, well, you know, if you have political opinions and if you have a heartbeat, you probably have a political opinion, um, 
but don't bring it into the classroom, how are you going to do that? If you're teaching history, history has a point of view. You cannot teach history without teaching it from a perspective. It, it just doesn't happen. There are books that you will use, and there are books that you will not use. Who's going to tell you which ones you don't get to use? We know who's going to tell you which ones you're supposed to use. But do you bring in David Irving's books when you're talking about the Second World War? You know, do you bring in a Holocaust denier uh, to give equal time to because that's another point of view? Or do you say, well, that's not really another point of view, that's just lies, and that's not a difference of point of view, it's a difference of facts, uh, alternative facts as we now call them, I think. Um, you know, where should we and where can we draw the line? But I feel very protective about teachers. I, I have to say that teachers are, hold a special place in, in my heart because I think that it's an enormously courageous thing to do to take this job. To decide that you're going to be a teacher means that you're putting yourself out there and I hope it also means that you care about the students who will be in your care. How are you going to balance your freedom of expression with their needs? And I think we have a lot of things that we can talk about this evening about where we have to leap over barricades in order to be good and profoundly caring professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Marvin. I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but I would like to argue with you a little <laughs> Thank about you. that. Uh, <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, James had mentioned three particular cases. Um, Malcolm Ross and the Audet case. Uh, the third case that James mentioned uh, was a case involving a student of mine hmm. at uh, Oise, uh, Jag Baduria. Mm -hmm. And for some of you who may not be aware, Mr. Baduria um, applied 34 times to become a vice principal without success uh, with the Toronto School Board, and he was uh, he felt that he felt a little rejected. <laughs> um, Tenacity. So in December eight, 1989, he sent a letter to the uh, Toronto Board of Education trustees and said to them that I wish that all of you were dead the same way as uh, what happened to the 14 women in, at Concordia University on December 6, 1989. So as a result, he was terminated. Um, he uh, went to arbitration. Uh, the arbitrator ar suggested that uh, he didn't really mean what he said. Anyhow, it took about eight years, and finally, in 1987, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld his termination. Um, but I do agree with Danielle that we're talking about competing societal interests. And some of these competing interests are protected certainly by Section 1 of the Charter. I think uh, arguably there are certain activities that cannot and should not and must not ever, in my opinion, uh, be protected in terms of freedom of expression. Um, violence or the threat of violence is, is unacceptable. Child pornography is another example of uh, activities because um, it doesn't have any social or moral value attached to it. And I think that's another thing that we have to look at in terms of what a teacher or student teacher may or may not do. Does it have, is there any value to it? Is there any societal value to it? Child pornography, there is no value. Um, issues of commercial speech, there may not be any value. Um, so 
I do agree about freedom of expression. I do agree that teachers should have the right to express themselves. Um, I agree that there should be a free flow of ideas uh, and images even. We live in a society, we have a diversity of ideas, we have a diversity of opinions. We live in a multicultural society today. The Judeo-Christian reference to the Education Act is, uh, with great respect, uh, ridiculous that that section should exist today. Um, if we complied, if every human being complied with Section 264 of the Education Act, there would not be no room in convents. <laughs> I mean, it would be impossible. Um, so freedom of expression, I would agree with, but there has to be limitations, whether it's harassment, um, Again, what is the society value attached to the expression that a teacher is uh, expressing? Um, what are the ideas, what are the images that he or she wishes to proje uh, project? But I think, again, um, if there's no societal interest, if there's no societal value, uh, if there's no societal benefit, then there may be uh, issues of limiting the expression of teachers in and outside of classrooms. And whether we agree or not, the reality is teachers are judged differently than perhaps other professionals because there is a trust relationship. There is a relationship of respect, respect for the pupils by the teacher the trust that teach, uh, students have with, with respect to, to, uh, to teachers. Teachers are in positions of power, and power is not necessarily with great respect about freedom. Power is not freedom. Power is respect. Power is about values. Um, and sometimes power has to be limited. Jerry. Thank you, Jim. Um, as Jim stated in his introduction of me, I am a lawyer and I work for a teacher's union. I have worked on union side law for all of my professional life for 29 years. Sorry? Oh. Is the mic on? Yep. Yes. Okay. Just bring it closer. That's all. And as a, as a lawyer working for a teacher's union, and I use the word union very consciously. Um, I see my role as two things. The first thing I do is I defend teachers when they get in trouble. And I hope I never have to see any of you if you were a member of ELECTA now or in the future. And the other thing is, and which is also a large reason why I'm here tonight, is my view of the law is the law is not an end in itself. The law is a tool. And it's a tool for social change. And just as the center is for trying to get social change, I see using the law to stretch things, to move the line. And that's part of why we're here tonight. And the way Jim framed it is, what is the reality today and what should it be? And so in that context, I'm just going to do some introductory remarks. Uh, first the bad and then the good. Um, and I urge everyone here to consider your starting point as teachers, and there's three, for me, there's three basic points or factors in your life as a teacher. Number one, you are a worker. And no disrespect to teachers as professionals. I know you're professionals. I know you have a right to use professional judgment, but that only goes so far. And do not forget, you are still a worker. You are an employee of a school board. That school board, like any other employer, runs the place, runs the school, runs the factory, runs the office. And there are two basic principles in law that tells you that. One, it's called the prerogative of management. If you're in a unionized setting, if it's not in the collective agreement, the union or the company wins. It, it ties always go to the employer. 
with, with a few exceptions, and the other one is obey now and grieve later. If you have an issue, you cannot tell your principal, I'm not doing it. I actually had a teacher once that, that thought he, he had the right to kick the principal out of his classroom. And I had to say, look, I'm really sorry, but it is not your classroom. That classroom belongs to the school board. You teach in that classroom. And you do have rights, you do have professional judgment, but it only goes so far. You have to obey your, your employer, you have to do what they say, and if it's wrong, you obey now and you file a grievance <coughs> to your union. And that's why unions are incredibly important, and I, I never stop taking the opportunity to say that. You have a union and use it. You get in trouble, you call your union. You have a question about your employer, you call your union. The second factor is you are a, you work in the public sector, the extended public sector. And there are a lot of people in society that do this false dichotomy between public and private and think they own you. I mean, how many people in the room have heard, I pay your, my taxes pay your salary, right? It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, but it is a conception. And you see things like the sunshine list in newspapers where public sector um, employers have to report the salaries of their employees. And the third thing is you teach children. And it is because of that that your status or obligations are elevated. There's a, a book, um, McKay and Sullivan, Teachers and the Law, and they talk about teachers are held to an almost superhuman standard. And that, that's very true. So you're a worker, you work in the public, expanded public sector, and you teach children. And because of that, you are held to a higher standard than most other people in society. Jim read out section 264.1c. You must have the highest regard for truth, justice, loyalty, love of country, humanity, benevolence, and all of the sobriety, and all of that. I hope none of you drinks. I don't think I don't think any or other spends lots of money. Any other <laughs> occupation is held to that standard, including judges who and people in Ontario College of Teachers uh, panels. Okay, so what that means is, and Jim talked about the trilogy, the Supreme Court, of, and they all come from the Supreme Court of Canada. And they're all misinterpreted, but they are held to the thing that teachers are teachers 24/7. Generally speaking, for workers. When you leave your workplace, you go home and your time is free. It does not exist for teachers. You are teachers 24 seven, and that's what the Supreme Court of Canada in all its wisdom has said. And I'll give you one example why, and, and this is especially true for social expression. The good part of my, talk, of my message is for political expression, it's much better than what people think it is, and teachers do have rights. And we'll get into that later, hopefully. But example, teacher went to a concert and was accused of smoking dope at the concert because one of his students happened to be nearby and he was questioned on that. And if that if the kid, if it was true and could have proven it, he would have been in trouble before his employer and before the Ontario College of Teachers. Because part of your job as a teacher of 24 seven is you are a role model. And generally, your off-duty time belongs to you, except in the law talks about, is there a nexus or a reasonable connection to your workplace? And generally speaking, it's things like, have, has your off-duty conduct harmed the reputation of your employer? Things like that. Um, but with teachers, it's even worse. It's, it's, have you violated values? And, these sentences I didn't make up, they come from case law. Have you violated values which should be taught to students? Has your off-duty conduct caused you to lose the respect of students, parents, or your colleagues? Are you violating school values? Is your behavior, is your smoking dope at the concert, does that create a loss of public confidence in the educational system? Again, you're a, and you're a role model. And the other thing that's really bad is, that makes it worse for teacher as worker, is there is a lower standard of proof for teachers because of the concept of loss of reputation. 
doesn't have to be proven that whatever you did in your off-duty conduct actually came to the attention of the press or to parents. The arbitrator or the College of Teachers can infer damage to reputation, loss of confidence in the school system. And there's one, one case where basically says any misconduct by a teacher is seen as harmful to students to their educational and personal growth, growth, so the only relevant question is, did it occur? So that's where, you at, where you're at. I hope you still want to be teachers after <laughs> my very brief talk, um, but that's where we're at. And I just want to talk about one case, and again, I want to distinguish between social expression and political expression. One leading case is a case called Schuin, and it happened in British Columbia where a male teacher and I don't know why, decided he and his wife, who was also a teacher, he took a photograph of her topless and entered it in, in a contest in a magazine. It was a, it was a British Columbia. For a $25 prize. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> entered it into a contest. The teacher's photograph made it into the magazine. And another thing that, and this is what you never do, if you're going to have to do things don't identify yourself as a teacher. <laughs> because the biography talked about the photographer, John was a teacher. The, the, the woman, I forgot her first was name, she's a teacher. And it mentioned the school board that they work at. So it was very easy to identify. Press got a hold of it, called the superintendent of the school board. Superintendent said, quote unquote, when I saw this and heard about it, it sickened and disgusted me. So the two teachers were suspended without pay for six weeks. Made it to the British, Court, uh, British Columbia Court of Appeal, and the teachers lost, both of them. The good thing is, sort of, the suspension was reduced to four weeks from six. I, I don't get how you even get there, but that's what happened. And the talk about teachers must maintain the But you've got to tell them the rest of the story. I'm getting Oh, good. <laughs> Teachers must maintain the confidence and respect of their superiors, their peers, and students. Teachers must not only be competent, they are expected to lead by example. Any loss of confidence or respect will impair the system and have an adverse effect upon those who participate in or rely upon it. You must, teachers must maintain a standard of behavior which most other students, citizens, need not observe because they don't have res public responsibilities to fulfill. That case was in 1987. Basically for social expression and things like that, it's still good law. Frankly, I don't know why the teachers would have done that in the first place, but they did it and you're, we're stuck with it. And as a side note, remember I said the superintendent was sickened and disgusted by the whole situation. Three years after the final case was released, the final decision was released, the woman left her husband and buried the superintendent. <laughs> So his, his sickness and his disgustedness didn't last very long. You can't make this stuff up. No, you can't make it up. True story. So, like I said, in terms of social expression, and Jim talked about, okay. we included in your package the professional advisory from the Ontario College of Teachers. It's very general. It doesn't go very far. It speaks very little of political expression. But for social expression, things like photographs of, of being naked, Facebook, whatever, it is good advice to keep you out of trouble. Frankly, my advice would be, and I tell you, don't go near those things. Do not use social media for anything related to the workplace. Just don't do it. There are cases where people have posted criticisms of their employer, criticisms of other, of other workers, and they get in trouble for it. You'll see a, a, Jerry? a little cartoon. I'm finished. Okay. A little cartoon. <laughs> Guy was about going to heaven. You were almost in heaven, but we saw your photo on Facebook. That really does apply. <laughs> Employers, school boards, they look for those things. They find things, and you will get in trouble for it. Political expression is completely different. There are a lot of things teachers can do to exercise their rights politically as citizens. And um, 
I'm being told to stop there. Yes. <laughs> Well, Jerry, you've thoroughly depressed me. Um, I'm glad I'm not a K-12 teacher uh, because almost anything I would do, anyth anything I would express that would be of any interest to anybody would be offensive to somebody. Can you find any kind of expression that isn't and offensive to so, somebody? <laughs> so you remember in my opening comments, I said we're talking about two things tonight. What are the current limits? We want to explore those, and what should the limits be, and our various speakers. So Marvin was addressing what some limits should be, which I think none of us would disagree with. Uh, and in fact, our legal obligation of school boards to have violence-free, harassment-free, discrimination-free workplaces. So that goes without question. It's how that gets extended to frugality, temperance, uh, and all other virtues where we get into trouble. And so the question is for teachers, what advice do you give them? If you say, well, try to live up to that standard because otherwise you could get in trouble, which is an impossible standard for anybody to live up to. Or do you say, well, n no, you try to live up to those things that are proper for you as a teacher and try to change those things that are in fact an unreasonable constraint on you as a teacher. Uh, and I'd give, just give you one example of the latter, the talk that Jerry gave could have been given 40 years ago for university and college teachers. I mean, except for the children part of it, but young people nevertheless. Uh, there were serious constraints on what faculty could say and do and, and so forth. And then we started, uh, in 1970, there were no unionized college or university teachers in Canada. Now about 100% of them are unionized. And in their collective agreements is academic freedom language, which explicitly gives you the right to use your best professional judgment in how you teach and what you teach, which explicitly gives you the right to be critical of any aspect of your workplace, publicly critical, which explicitly gives you the right to exercise all your rights as a citizen without sanction by the employer. And that's a change that occurred over a 40-year period. Uh, strangely, and it's a little different in the U.S., but strangely here, there's no suggestion of academic freedom for K-12 teachers. Uh, in fact, it's a huge battle in the college system. The Ontario Secondary, I'm sorry, the Ontario Public, uh, OPSU, Ontario Public Employees, uh, Public, Service uh, Public Service Employees Union, has been, on behalf of the community college teachers, has been trying to make its top priority academic freedom for college teachers and the employer said, hell will freeze over before we agree to that. So these things are really contentious. So the question is, I, I, I um, said things like you said, Jerry, about uh, I was complaining about how I was dealing with 80 academic freedom cases of where people's academic freedom, had, they had done things that had, the employer had objected to and had taken action against them. And I was moaning about this to one of my colleagues and they said, Jim, you have 67,000 members and only 80 of them did anything that would offend the employer? Surely, just in living their life as proper educators, they're going to incur the wrath of employers. And I'm, here, we're not talking about discrimination, harassment, uh, violence. We're talking about expressing views on matters, raising questions about what the principal is doing, or how the school is organized, um, which we take to be something teachers are good at. Who knows better about how school should be run than you? And your silencing is actually a cost to society. So how do we deal with these things? Well, I think it's a real problem. And I, I think that, that you know, because of, the, of the, the cases that we've mentioned and many more that we're likely to mention, I think that there's a real quelling, a real chilling effect on, on teachers that they're terrified of, you know, standing up and saying, what they, they want to say. And because the people who tend to be caught up in, in the litigation tend to be really stupid. You know, they've done really weird or, or really crazy things. Um, but they're, you know, but people are, are nervous about being the next one. If you, you know, if, if, if somebody says, well, you know, what you've said 
you know, is really offensive and I'm going to complain about it, you may have your union, Jerry, but, you know, are, how far can they, can they stand up for you? I, you know, I often think about the Kempling case, for example. Um, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Mr. Kempling. Mr. Kempling was a guidance counselor in British Columbia, still is, I think. Um, and he also wrote uh, a column for his local newspaper, like the, uh, the, the, the weekly newspaper. And in it, he said that um, he could cure homosexuality and that uh, as the guidance counselor, if parents would like to bring their children uh, or send their children to his office, he would be able to cure them of homosexuality through Jesus. This he taught in a public school. Is he the vice president? Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're not talking about yeah. the United States. <laughs> that was his next step. Um, you know, there was a complaint. Uh, he was suspended for four weeks in August. Um, and then he went back to teaching. Now, some of us would say, you know, this guy doesn't belong as, as, a, uh, as a guidance counselor. And other people have said, well, that's his opinion. He is a religious person. He believes that he's doing good, that there's a societal value to what he had to say. Um, you know, should he have been disciplined at all is a question some people ask, and other people ask, why did they let him back in the school? So, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't have any comfort in saying that we know the right thing to do all of the time or, or, or that these things are, are clear cut. I think that we, you know, we really need to ask ourselves, each of us, uh, who is each person who is a teacher, you know, what is it I'm dying to say? Um, can I say it? And if not, why not? You know, am I chilling myself unnecessarily? Um, or, uh, you know, or am I re do I have reason to, to fear that the discipline is out there and I could lose my job or, or suffer some kind of a suspension? Marvin, what are your thoughts on Well, I want to, interestingly, uh, Jerry used the example of uh, a teacher going to a party, a teacher going out at night and smoking dope at a concert and next to him is uh, one of his students. He's behind him and he didn't know. Be <laughs> behind him and he didn't know. The That's sad thing about this story, <laughs> the sad thing when you think about it, is he's one year too early. <laughs> <laughs> A year from now, yeah, marijuana will be legal. So that raises another interesting question. Even if marijuana is legal and you can carry 30 grams or 29 grams or whatever, and you're with your student, are you gonna be disciplined for that? Well, because sobriety is on the list and alcohol Sobriety is on the list, so uh, uh, again, that, uh, that's that's going to be an interesting. Uh, I'm I'm one of these people that is very supportive of the uh, College of Teachers. Uh, some people aren't, some people are, but when you think about it, before 1996, it was rare that you got rid of a teacher for whatever reason. Now we have the college, we have the amendments to the legislation, we have a whole process and procedure. <laughs> that's there to protect teachers and also protect the public. Um, but I certainly agree that uh, in terms of balancing, you know, where, where do you go? The problem is, as I think uh, Jerry indicated, the teacher is a worker. He's an employee of the school. He's an he or she is an employee of the board. And the reality is uh, you work for different principles. There are things that you might be able to get away with what, with one principle that you can't get away with another principle. I've always said that the greatest power that a principle has is the power of discretion. <laughs> it's the power of discretion. So again, how far can teachers go often depends on the specific school, and, the spe and not only the specific school, the specific community. Um, we live in a very inclusive, hopefully um, diverse community, 
but the inclusive diverse community may not exist 200 or 400 miles from Toronto. So community standards is another factor that I think has to be considered in terms of expression. You're gonna get away with, I think, theoretically a lot more in Toronto than you might in some small town where there may only be one school. So how are teachers to know what they may or may not do if we do have differing community standards? What do you think, Jerry? We use the charter. <laughs> and how, does that help? Yeah, it helps <laughs> tremendously. I'm not, it, it's not easy in terms of what you can do and what you can't do. You, teachers like anybody else, you have to decide what is important to you. My bias, I couldn't care less about social expression. I don't, I don't see a need to post a, a photograph of myself drinking alcohol on a Saturday night on the web. I, I just don't see that as important. I will never do it. I had a niece who posted some photos of a family party. First thing I did was I called her and said, you didn't ask my permission to post me and take it down immediately. Please do that. That's not important to me. Political expression is important to me. So you have to decide what's important. And then what you do, what I think you do, is you use, you use the tools you have. If you see something wrong in, with your employer, my advice is don't be a hero. Don't take, don't take your principal on by yourself. Use your union. That's what the union is for. That's what the grievance procedure is for. If there's something wrong, you go to your union. If you think you're being harassed, you go through the channels. You, you go through your union, or if there's somebody in management you can trust, you say, I'm being harassed, and you, you as an employer have a duty to make it stop. If it doesn't stop, you go to your union and you file a grievance. And thankfully for teachers in Ontario, we have mandatory unionization. You, ha you, you automatically belong to ETFO, OSSTF, OECTA, or AFO, the, the, the French teachers union. You use that. And the other thing we have, and I disagree with Marvin about community standards. We live, in a, we live in a country, a national country, and we have something called the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has values attached to it of inclusiveness, of diversity. And teachers and school boards have a fiduciary duty, not only to teach math, but to teach people, to teach students how to be, how to be citizens. And reminds me of a good case about community standards where British Columbia teacher wanted to bring in three books. I think it was called Chamberlain. The mm -hmm. teacher's name is Chamberlain. Yeah. He wanted to bring in three books uh, about same-sex marriages. The school board said no. And the reason they said no was this will offend community standards of our small community. It's a very conservative, Christian community and they don't like gay marriage. So we don't want to offend some of the parents in the community. It went to court and the school board lost. And the court said, and there's a lot of cases, school boards have a duty to promote charter values of diversity and inclusiveness. You cannot discriminate and exclude stu kids because some, some parents may be offended. And the prohibition was struck down on those three books and the court said, school board, you go back and you look at this again. So you can use the charter. You can, and can you use your union? And fortunately for me, I work, I don't wanna get into this debate, but I work for a Catholic union in the Catholic schools. We, major tenet of the Roman Catholic faith is social justice. We have tons of articles and statements about promoting social justice and in, when we use that you're, and what you do with your curriculum or whatever you, you make it fit within the curriculum and in our case you use social justice as a means so you figure out what tools you have and you use them you're making me feel better jerry i mean after after your first talk it sounded like it was hopeless well, if we did anything bad and good no no but you know, you're addressing the question of how all the people in this room who want to be good teachers, who want to educate their students to be active, engaged, informed citizens will necessarily have to model some of the behavior they're encouraging. And just being a total 
uh, non-entity that never offends anybody is hardly a role model for good citizenship. So what, what heartened me about what you were talking about subsequently is there are things you can do to try to find ways to do what you think is right professionally as a teacher in educating your students and having the right to live your life as you wish, not constrained by this abstract notion that you're a teacher 24 seven and therefore unless what you're doing is uh, something that's consistent with the Ontario Education Act section 246 or 264, 264 uh, you're in trouble. Uh, and to go back to what Marvin was saying, maybe we do need to identify those things that are clearly inappropriate. Violence, discrimination, harassment, child pornography, sexual exploitation. Uh, those are the things that take up most of the Ontario College of Teachers cases. Yes. But those list of things then get broadened to say, well, there's a whole bunch of other things that may be offensive that could treat it the same way, and that's where we get into trouble. But I think we're also still stuck with definitions. And uh, forgive me, Marvin, but the child pornography section really worries me because of its definition. It's very vague, it's overly broad, and we know that there are young people who are sexting one another or who are taking films of, of themselves engaged in sexual acts who have been charged with the, the, the uh, you know, creation and dissemination of child pornography. I think teachers need to talk about that. Um, I'm not suggesting they bring child pornography into the classroom, but you know, I, I, I used to get teased about being the person who'd walk into high school to talk to kids about child pornography. But <laughs> I, think, you know, I think we do need to talk about these things. I'm not suggesting that we, you know, that, uh, you know, violence, as far as I'm concerned, nobody hits any kid, but should we talk about violence? Should we be talking about the, the experiences that some of the students ha themselves have had, which may entail violence? You know, how much are we willing to, I'm not saying that we're there as therapists, teachers are not there as therapists, but, you know, we've had cases where, I mean, I remember numbers of years ago, there was a young student who was um, assigned a, an essay, and he was somebody who had been targeted by bullies rather a lot. He wrote uh, an essay about how, um, or I guess it was a short story and not an essay, how he was going to uh, murder all the bullies. Um, and he had a fairly elaborate plan. He never did anything physical, he was arrested. The school brought in, brought in the police. He was arrested, ended up spending Christmas in jail. Um, you know, should the teacher have said, no, you can't write about that. And again, we weren't talking about children's expression, but a teacher who encourages people to write about their own life expressions may be somebody who writes about his or her own life ex expressions. After the Eli Langer case, and some of you may remember uh, the Eli Langer case. <coughs> Eli Langer was a Toronto artist whose, um, actually his gallery was not very far from here. He um, had etchings and drawings uh, of people uh, young and old involved in sexual acts. Uh, he never used real life models. He never you know, did anything uh, inappropriate uh, with other humans, but a lot of people were pretty offended by his work, or not even that many people actually, because it was he was arrested and the stuff w was held. I encountered a teacher who told me that she used her small children as life models. She was an artist and an art teacher, and she said she's taken she had taken to um, hiding all of her artwork under the bed because she was really afraid that if somehow somebody saw her pictures of her small children nude, that she would be susceptible to uh, punishment as far as the education was concerned, but also the law. And you know, th this is what happens when we have these vague and overly broad laws, the chilling effect comes in. And you know, can we comfort teachers that, that they have the permission to be artists, to be singers, to be dancers, as well as, as to be teachers? And I don't know what to say. It worries me. What do you think? Marvin? <laughs> well, I guess I was put in the middle for a reason. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I, I wasn't sure what you were saying with respect to child pornography. 
I was. I mean, we have legislation now, and certainly kids cannot. Can you hear back there? Kids cannot distribute uh, naked pictures of themselves uh, in the social media that they could be charged with a crime. I know. Does that is that okay? Okay. I, I want to divert our attention away <laughs> from that and come back to what teachers can do and not do. Yeah. Um, but uh, let me just say, because uh, Jerry's talking about the Catholic system and. What I find interesting, of course, and I don't know how he would respond to it, is the issue of freedom of expression where it conflicts with Catholicism. That's a debate for another evening. <laughs> <laughs> you want to dodge but that I one can for now. tell you, in things like gay straight alliances, when Catholic teachers are heavily involved in promoting that, the church is a Jesus is on their side. I, you can have a debate about what is true Catholic faith and what isn't, you know? And we have gay straight alliances in the Catholic system. So, but in terms of what you were saying, what teachers can and can't get, get away with as artists, um, I don't know what to say about child pornography, and, and I just, I don't have, obviously I'm, I'm strong. Why don't we come back to a simpler thing? what they can get away with in terms of political expression. Okay, well, one thing I... So can you say something about Trump in your classroom? I think you can. You can in Toronto. I don't believe <laughs> yeah. you can. Try New York. But try I Texas. Know. Well, no, you're okay in New York. <laughs> try yeah, Muncie, yeah, Indiana. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one point, though, you can't get away with everything. And, and I heard a teacher once say, and I, I, I have to say I really like this, just you cannot... Your classroom is not your living room. What you can get away with in your living room doesn't mean you can get away with it in your classroom because you do have responsibilities. And you just, you can't do whatever you want. There are restrictions. And another restriction is the obligation to treat your students respectfully. Um, a good example of that in the higher education system that you may have read about was uh, this guy who teaches at the University of Toronto where a trans student asked to be referred to by a, a non-gendered uh, pronoun. And the teacher went into a rant about how he doesn't agree with this student's view. Well, the, in our view, the, the, the professor has a right not to agree, but he doesn't have a right to reject the student's request. That's being unnecessarily disrespectful to that student, right? So he has a right to express his views in his teaching or outside, but he doesn't have a right to say to the student, you have to be called what I want to call you. Uh, we promise to give you a chance to ask questions, make comments. Uh, Ange, do you have a mic for folks? Ange, do you have a mic for folks if they have questions? Um, we're all teachers, we teacher voices. No, no, we, <laughs> this is being recorded, so we, we want to make sure we get the mellifluous teacher voices properly. Uh, So who would like was to there somebody the, the black shirt? The man there. Sure. If you could just yeah, share your name and your question. Can you stop recording? Pardon me? Can you stop recording? Well, no, no, we're recording. They don't want to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> That's the chilling effect. <laughs> it won't be on your faces at all. Yeah, it won't show you. Okay, you don't have to say your name. You can just, it's only focus on the panel answering. Is that okay? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting. We've had lots of these. The first time that's ever come up. Which may speak to the reality of the chilling effect that what we're talking about. We've got a good lawyer for you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll find you. Or else, I'll tell you what else you could do. If you have a question you would rather not ask yourself, write it out and give it to Ange, and I'll read it to the panel. That way, where it came from won't be known. Uh, my question is around the classroom and restrictions within the classroom. So for example, a math teacher, uh, what I heard is that since we are employees of the board, our job is to teach math. Um, so how do we sort of balance that if there's a teachable moment around other things like race or uh, some homophobic comments get played out and uh, we want to use that to, to have a conversation about those things but we are in a math classroom personally i th i think you can and i my background is, is not in education i came from the construction sector which is completely different 
And the one thing I've learned about are these things called teachable moments. Um, I know there are some basic rules of teachable moments. I don't know about other schools, but I've learned you do not talk about personal, your personal life. You do not relate personal stories. I've had a lot of teachers get in trouble for that, so you don't do that. But you do have a right if a student is being disrespectful or is promoting hatred, you do have a right to say something. And I don't think that would be difficult to defend. I have an example of someone close to me. Is my brother was a school teacher. And one student tried to tell a racist joke. And it, it was, the class was history. It had nothing to do with history. So he took the moment and talked about racism it through, throughout history. And then lo and behold, the kid's parents came to the school the next day and complained that Mr. Razzo was interfering in their family because racist jokes are acceptable in their home. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding. They really did. And he was called down and thankfully the principal sided with him and supported him and said that was part of the classroom. He didn't raise it. It came up and he dealt with it appropriately. And I don't see anyone getting in trouble for defending or for speaking out against racism or hatred or exclusiveness. Marvin, did you want to answer, respond to the question? Well, part of, I think Spent part of what wrong. Jerry, uh, in terms of parents, I mean, I, I spent 22 years in family court. That's why I look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Was that easy a job, eh? And, uh, you know, the teacher can do perfectly, quote unquote, normal things, although God only knows what normal means. But you've got to deal with parents. That's, that's, that's a variable. It's, it's impossible to uh, uh, teachers expressing himself. I mean, I, you know, so another teacher might have thrown the kid out of the room, might have suspended the kid, whatever. But, you know, you go home and tell a story to your parents and uh, you're into a different scenario. Danielle, yeah, I mean, I think that te teachers, no matter what subjects they're teaching, are teaching people. And, you know, there will be teachable moments that will not necessarily be relevant to your subject area. But if you don't say something, like the racist joke, for example, um, yeah, that's a bad choice. And I think that you, you have to... I mean, it, this is not a risk-free profession. You may have noticed that already. Um, I think that, that you know you have a moral obligation to protect the students in your care. If a student comes to you and is telling you something about how they've been victimized by an incident, um, you know there are resources available to you. You don't just say, "Oh, I can't talk about that. I'm a math teacher." I think that that, that would really be shirking your your duty. Then again, you don't do what Malcolm Ross did, who was also a math teacher. So, you know, I, I, I think there's, again, a very difficult place to draw the line, but, you know, you, you do have discretion. I mean, just, you're a math teacher, so you have an obligation to teach math. That doesn't mean you can't say anything else. So what you can't do is teach about Shakespeare all year, right? But if, you, if something comes up, whether it be around uh, homosexuality or racism or whatever, no matter what you do is gonna convey a message. If someone tells a racist joke and you let it go, you're condoning it. So you don't have a choice about being neutral. There is no neutrality. And there are certain values, both charter values and educational values, that say certain things are unacceptable in a school embarrassment, discrimination. And so if you let discrimination go by, then you're actually not upholding the values of the school. Yeah. Um, and if you subsequently get an angry parent seeing the principal, the principal goes after you, you really should do what Jerry said, and that is go see your, your federation. Because you are actually doing the right thing and need to be defended. And if you do get in trouble, either the school board tries to discipline you or the parent files a complaint to the College of Teachers. There are cases which say school boards and teachers have a positive duty to act and promote charter values. 
you're not just supposed to sit back. You actually have a legal duty to address those issues. Okay, and can you bring the mic? As long as it's not hatred. I'm, I'm okay. Just voice, so I'm good. Um, I just <laughs> Where do I need the mic? Okay. Well, I want to respond to his, I want to respond to him. Kind of okay, let her go for the need. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. You have the mic. People are polite. <laughs> but actually the mic is half the law. 90% <laughs> of the people are Uh Okay, so, oh, Jesus. See, I told you I'm You're welcome everybody up to. No, we need it just to. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Okay, um, so one of the, the one of the things that comes to mind is that yes, uh, I'm a TDSB teacher, and um, we do have an equity policy in place, so it's not actually a choice; it's an obligation. And the teachers that don't follow that obligation are actually not being professional. Um, so, but there's a contradiction, which is I think very apparent, is that we're not allowed to be the humans that we are uh, privately. Um, and uphold the values that we uphold. So if I go to a public protest and I get assaulted by a police officer, I'm not allowed to strike back. Um, that is problematic to me. Uh, it's problematic in many avenues. It's also problematic to me because of the te kids that I teach. If my kids are being assaulted by police officers in their own classrooms, in their own schools, and I am teaching them that that's okay, that's problematic to me on many levels. Uh, a lot of teachers here, there are five of which I know, and we're all activists, we all know each other from various other venues. Um, the things that are problematic to me also have to do with, for example, if I look around here, just to call it out, there are very few people of color. And the expression that people have, people of color, and why they are not present, why those voices are not present to talk to us about their system regarding expression, is extremely important and extremely ignored. I'm a Latina female. I identify as Latina. I'm passionate. I speak with my hands. I have been told more times than I can count to quiet down. Told by whom? My male peers, my colleagues, my superiors, my administration, two positions, equity positions that I applied to that were given to males, which are far less qualified than me et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So expression and what, how we decide to express ourselves also comes with a ton of intersectionality and information that also needs to be really considered when we talk about who the hammer is gonna come down on and how. Gender's another huge one on that one. So. Can I, I, let me just comment and say that it's people like you that will see change. There'll be change because of people like you. Neutrality is crap. Change doesn't happen through neutrality. You have to take a position. Sometimes you may pay for taking the position, but you would never, you'd do the same thing over and over again until the day you die, and I hope you do, because we will get change. Actually, actually, I just wanted to chime in and also just say the exact same thing. I'm one of the people that are like you at my school. I'm very much similar, uh, except I have the other gender. I'm male. And, uh, but I've been told the exact same thing you've been told. And because of my stature, I'm tall and, and all that. And I'm very loud and I'm opinionated. And I, I do the same thing. But it's true about pushing the professional boundaries because you know where they are and you can, you can test them out, right? And it's knowing how to push them and who to push them with. And it does make change. It, I've seen it. Um, just going back to the uh, earlier uh, person's uh, comment. It's like the student that in, in the uh, Durham Catholic Board that went to this, the school dance with the same-sex partner. That resulted yep. in change. Exactly. So, you know, anyhow. It's also the whole thing about leading by example, going back to Section 264 of the Education Act, right? So, um, and how it's interpreted, because law is all interpreted, right? And you guys know that very well. Um, but I just wanted to say, speaking about law, is that we also have a character education document, right? The character education document all, applies to all of us, and we are also responsible for teaching that as well, right? It's not really ever talked about a lot in schools, but it is a document put out by the Ministry of Education. We all have a responsibility to do that. So you can use those kind of things to talk about those issues that come up in your classroom, 
right? And also in the grade seven, eight curriculum, um, which I taught for many years, um, it talks specifically about anti-homophobia, anti-transphobia, and anti-discrimination. So that covers you as well, right? That's right in the curriculum document. One thing in terms of using tools, and I know this is easy for me to say because I'm not on the front line in the classroom. If you face discrimination because of gender or whatever enumerated ground, you have the human rights code. If you are being if you're being denied the, a department head because you're a woman or whatever, you have the human rights code. And that school boards have a legal obligation to obey the code. And they can't deviate from it. It's easier said than done. One thing you have to do is anytime you think you've, you, you've faced any comment or whatever, violates the code, you write it down, you document it, and then go to your union and say, I'm the victim of, of discrimination based on whatever. And they go to the, the employer and the employer has a, a legal obligation to address it. And I, I know that's easier said than done and I know it goes on but you've got, you've got to use the tools you have, and the code is a, is a very good one. And I can tell you, school boards do not like being accused of discrimination. They don't like articles in the front page of their local newspaper alleging that they discriminated against somebody. They don't like it. And they will deal with it if you push, but you've got to push hard, and again, don't do it alone. You know. And the other thing is, and I've seen this a lot, and. I, and a lot of teachers think their principal is the friend. <laughs> and I've seen this, and I've had cases where they go, well, I went to the principal in confidence, and I told her this, or I told him this, and I'm going, the principal is your employer. The principal is not your friend. You don't tell your principal anything in confidence, because legally, they can't keep it in confidence. Don't trust your principal not to report you if you confide in them on something, OK? I mean, they actually have an obligation to. Yeah, they do. You know? And they're in different unions. And it's the same thing, and College of Teachers was mentioned. That's a, this is also a debate for another evening. The College of Teachers is not your friend. The College of Teachers has a duty to protect the public interest. They have a duty to prosecute teachers, okay? And that's what they do. Okay, one more question. Is there somebody back there? Uh, we'll do two more questions, that one and then one up here. And then we'll break. Go ahead, please. I don't think your mic's on. No, no. Oh, like that. There, there we go. It's working. Um, th so I, first of all, I want to say thank you to my colleague for raising the issue of the equity policy in TDSB. I know probably not everyone here is a TDSB teacher. That's an important document. And I think uh, the equity arguments do speak to some of the issues that have been raised here. I guess the concern I want to raise is um, wh where uh, equity arguments are used to shut people down. So for example, if uh, you are, let's say, talking about white privilege, and then you are in turn accused of, of, of racism. Or let me, talk, let me raise a, a particularly contentious issue, which is the issue of Palestine, talking about Palestine, whether outside of the classroom or inside of the classroom, which um, some organizations, uh, B'nai B'rith, for example, uh, use their considerable uh, uh, resources to promote as hate speech. So where you have these equity arguments that are being deployed uh, to shut people down. Um, I, this, this, for me, I guess, is, is a, a concern. Um, and I was wondering if uh, some people on the pa panel can speak to that. I, because one thing we could really use is some of our professional associations to actually be pushing um, for, um, to be pushing more of an equity uh, uh, um, uh, uh, lens when we talk about freedom of expression. Well, do you want to speak to it? or? I, I'm happy to start. start. <laughs> Your federations reflect the diversity of our society. So there's elements of racism amongst the members, there's elements of discriminatory behavior. Uh, they themselves uh, have debates about how to be, how aggressive to be on some of these things. And when I would talk at CUT, give the same advice Jerry was giving with, if you're discriminated against, if you're treated inappropriately, go to your uh, faculty association. I'd have people afterwards say to me, well, you just don't know my faculty association. They never do anything. But that's another thing, as Marvin said, there's not gonna be change unless you, you gotta demand that they do things. 
If they don't do things, you go to the Labor Board and charge them with a failure of duty of fair representation. What you'll find in most cases, however, is most of them welcome opportunities to do things um, because this provides taking on a case that's really an important one, provides an opportunity for winning rights for a whole bunch of people, not just the individual uh, involved. Um, so it is, it's, I mean, you're facing a challenge in dealing with your employer, you're facing a challenge in dealing with your colleagues because of the diversity of these views. And there, you know, there really isn't easy advice to give you other than just keep pushing. Um, and you have a lot of things on your side, both various policies of school boards, the policies of most federations on these matters are very good. Um, and you have to hold them to their policies, and most of them would welcome that, some won't, and those have to be challenged. I don't know if that answers your question at all or not. <laughs> I, I was just gonna mention the, the, the issue that was brought up earlier about the parents coming in to complain. Um, my, my understanding is that uh, if, if you do something, you'll get one set of parents coming to complain, and if you don't do something, you'll get another set of parents coming to complain. So, uh, you know, you decide which ones you want. I mean, the best advice in deciding what to do in a situation, if you can look yourself in the mirror afterwards and feel you did the right thing, then you live with the consequences. It's when you decide to do something you don't agree with because it seems convenient or whatever, and then you get in trouble anyways, then you really kick yourself. So if you can get in trouble, you might as well get in trouble for things you believe in. Last question or comment. No, no we need uh, So my question is related to the limits uh, to teachers' expression when they publicly question board policy on board property. And the case I'd like to refer to is the BC teachers um, who uh, provided pamphlets criticizing uh, board policy with respect to standardized education and the arbitrator um, essentially cited in favor of BCTF that it was in the public interest for teachers to do so and so it overrided management's rights. And so what are your thoughts on that? It was the right decision. <laughs> and it was 100% the right decision and uh, too bad they didn't do it in your region. And to finish I the mean, story, with that respect went, to what happened. Sorry, yeah. that it, it made it through the court system. Let me see if I I've got that written down here. I'm not sure if it ended at the BC Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court of Canada, but the courts affirmed that uh, the teacher's right to do that, and the decision talks about citizens, it talks about the charter, it talks about promoting charter values, it talks about freedom of expression. That is freedom of expression. Teachers are allowed to do it. But the thing is, you gotta do it as a group. One person doesn't get up at a meeting and start screaming and calling their principal or their superintendent an asshole or whatever. You, that you don't do. You do it together as a group. And there are a lot of cases, well not a lot, but there are cases throughout the country which have affirmed Section 2B freedom of expression. And the cases talk about positive duties to affirm those values. And it is a good thing that you teach your kids you should be politically involved. You're a citizen of this country and you have a right to participate. And it's important to educate kids that they have the right and the duty to participate in their country. I think that's a very good, oh, yes. Does it, I mean, a good use for that, doesn't that mean that the uh, teacher as a public servant or uh, a worker in the public sphere um, has responsibilities as well, and has, as a result as well, some rights with a private employee does not, because the private employee does not work in the public interest. And so in this case, it enlarges the role of the teachers to take on that position because they deem it in the public interest. Now, of course, whether it's deemed in the public interest is decided by an arbitrator, judge, or so forth, I understand that aspect, but isn't that, if, if you're given that duty, then you're given certain rights along with it as well, along with the responsibility to do it properly and so on, civil discourse or whichever. Um, and that's why I'm wondering, because when you stated earlier on that uh, you have to see the, um, individual in the public sphere as an employee, uh, which is analogous to uh, someone working in the private sphere. 
but this case, at least the way I, I read it, allows us certain rights uh, when we argue uh, with respect to the public interest. Yeah, that, you, you are right. You're correct. There is, you know, there is the flip side, the negative side, which I talked about at the very beginning. You're a public employee, and people, the public seems to think they own you. But also, as a as a person in the public education system, where you have a fiduciary duty to students to teach them proper values, you do have an obligation to do those things, and you do have a right to when someone objects to it. And that includes involvement in the political process. I think that's a good place to end. I hope you'll join me in thanking the panel for uh, their presentations tonight.